good morning. It's nice to hear you guys. Welcome, my name is Kelly Fernandez. I am on the weekend teaching team here at First Free Church and also teach in the discipleship department. And I just wanna say welcome if you're joining us online this morning as well. I am here with my husband, Glenn. We just celebrated 16 years on Friday. <clears throat> we joke and say that we've been happily married seven, right? We've been happily married seven, we've been married for 16. It's amazing what God can do in a marriage though. And, um, and I wanna share with you a story this morning. It's actually a, an embarrassing story. Um, but I'm going to tell you because there's a point to it. About a month ago, I was out for a walk, kind of lost in thought. I'm one of those people, if you ever see me, I, I like to power walk. And sometimes I wear a headset so it looks like I'm talking to someone, but I pray out loud because I just cannot pray in my head. So if you've ever seen me walking, I'm probably walking and praying and talking to God. It, that's why the headset's on. So I'm out power walking, and I look up on Riders Club Road, and I see this Doverman Pincher puppy running in and out of traffic. And cars are slamming on brakes, and they're honking at the puppy, and I'm worried about the puppy. And so I'm looking for the owner. I don't see the owner anywhere. I keep walking, and I see a lady coming down a side street, and I'm pointing like, there's your dog. There's your dog. She's not moving any faster than I am. So I take off running, okay? I run up to this dog, this puppy. I grab it by its collar. Now, I have never been around a Doberman Pinscher before, and I didn't know they'd start you know, snarling at you, and they're trying to, he starts wiggling his head, and he's trying to pull out of his collar, and I'm a little nervous, but my friend Vicky had showed me one time what to do to a dog if it attacks you, so I was ready if I needed to defend myself, and this thing is just bucking against its collar, and, and just at me, and I don't know what to do, except start dragging it towards its owner, and it just got worse and worse, and I thought, you're such a cute little puppy, why are you behaving like this? Finally, I get to the point where I'm so frustrated, I did what any mom of five children would do when you're exasperated. I yelled at the dog, and I said, if you hadn't run away, we wouldn't be in this position, or something like that. And it stopped, and it looked at me for just a moment, and then it went back to pulling on its collar. And right before it let go, I just yelled, go! And I let that thing go, and it took off running for its owner. And she picked it up, and she's like, wait, wait, wait. The reason I couldn't chase him down is I have a bad tailbone. He's never run away before, thank you so much. You know, and you kind of walk home from the adrenaline of that, and I... I get home and our seven-year-old's sitting outside and I said, Sethi, I gotta tell you what just happened. And I told him this story and he's like, mama, you're a puppy rescuer, you know? And, and when your little kids think you're cool, it's cool, enjoy it, because then they hit teenage years and you don't know much according to your teens. But anyway, um, it feels good. And so a couple days later, I was out for another walk thinking on that experience. I'm out for a walk and lo and behold, I see an animal down the block walking in circles, like, in, in not, not big circles, but kind of small circles. And I'm like, and then I see a lady. She pulls over in a black car. She gets out. She gets on her phone, and I'm like, I know what to do. So I jog up to her, and I said, is he yours? Do you want me to help you catch him? And she looked at me. She put her phone down, and she goes, that's a possum. <laughs> I didn't look. Partly because I need to start wearing glasses. I already know that. And, and so I'm, I'm looking at her, and I'm horrified, and I kind of look over my shoulder, and Ooh, there's a possum. Have you ever seen a possum up close? They kind of got robbed <laughs> in looks. You know what I mean? I know God created everything good, but this was an ugly-looking possum, kind of scary. And I kind of looked at it. Ooh. I turned back to her, and I said, I really need to start wearing my glasses. Thank you for what you're doing. And I turned and walked away, rather embarrassed if I had just looked again, I would have seen that was a possum and not a cute puppy, right? But I didn't. I was just relying on the, what had happened a couple days ago. I share that with you because when Shane started the, the book of Galatians, to be honest, I was, um, I was a little nervous because sometimes I hear these, yeah, but coming through my mind. Like when he's been preaching on Galatians, he's been saying, you are saved by grace, you are saved by grace through faith in Christ. That's it. There's nothing added. But there's part of me that's like, yeah, but because I grew up in a very rule-based church. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Raise your hand if you grew up in a very rule-based church. So a lot of you know what I'm talking about, okay? And when you hear over and over these rules, these things you have to practice, the way you have to perform for God to love you. I never heard about salvation. Never knew I could have a relationship with God. But I knew what fear of God meant. 
And I labored under this, this yoke, this weight of, I'll never be good enough, but I'm going to keep performing because I don't want God mad at me. Some of you can relate? Yeah. What happens when you come to know the truth? It becomes like a sledgehammer that breaks the chains. You know what I mean? Those things that held you captive. It breaks the lies. So when, when Shane starts teaching on that, I'm thinking, yeah, you're saved by grace through faith. But these old traditions, these old rules that I remember from my, my um, traditional church start creeping up. Some of you may understand. Let me give you some examples, okay? The Word of God. I was never instructed to read the Word of God. Not once was I told to pick up the Word of God and read it for myself. I was taught that the leader of the church was the one who interpreted Scripture and that was the final authority. You don't question him. Based on what he said, that was the final authority. And then you open this Bible up and you read, um, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You read Romans 12. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And you realize, wait a second, I'm renewed by reading this word. I don't have to wait. I, I get to pick this up and I get to read it myself. <sighs> It's like a chain falls off. There's freedom, okay? Another example would be like death. I was always taught that when I die, my soul will go to a place for about one to 2,000 years, and it will hang out there to get purified in order to be holy enough for heaven. Some of you are nodding your heads, okay? Then you read 1 Peter 3.18 that says, and Christ died for sins once for all. You read Romans 3.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Eternal life begins at the moment of salvation and it's the rest of your life. My soul doesn't need to go somewhere to be purified. I stand before the Father, justified, clean, purged because of what Jesus did. It's like a sledgehammer breaking that yoke. So even as, as Shane's been, and John have been preaching Galatians, right? You're saved by grace. Walk in that grace. Even though I'm a new creation, even though I'm a new creation, the old is gone, the new has come. These thoughts still rise up like, isn't there a yeah, but? Isn't there a yeah, but? That's what Paul was trying to do in the book of Galatians. We have been in a series in the book of Galatians. And the theme of that is, you're saved by grace, now walk in it. There's no yeah, buts. And what happened is the old hats came back in. The old, the old group of, you know what? If you, if you follow the law and you do things perfectly, you might be saved. And they came in and they started imposing these rules and regulations back on the church, like circumcision was talked about a couple weeks ago. Okay? And as Paul is writing the letter of Galatians, it's as if he's saying, hey, Galatians, look again. That's a possum, not a puppy. This morning, we're actually going to push pause on the book of Galatians. And we are going to go to Matthew chapter 11. There's a lot of nuggets in Matthew 11, but there's an underlying theme that I want you to understand that Jesus set, okay? If you are a person who loves a linear message, I'm really sorry, this isn't for you. It's not an A, B, C, one, two, three thing. There's a lot of nuggets in Matthew chapter 11, and I trust the Lord to speak to you what he wants to speak to your heart, okay? And I'm going to pray that right now. Father, I thank you that your word is enough. God, your word brings life. Your word can transform a life. And Father, I thank you for the, the people who came out here uh, this morning and who are tuning in online. God, I pray for those who are bound in chains, who carry yokes and burdens, they would be set free today with the truth. Father, sanctify us in truth, for your word is truth. And Father, I pray for each person that whatever they've come in with, that whatever they're seeking you for, God, you would speak to them a right now word for where they're at. And I trust you, Lord, to take this message and all these notes and do with it what you want, Father, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so if you have your Bibles, if you don't, it's okay because we'll have it on the screen. I want you to open up to Matthew chapter 11. Let me set the scene for you before we dig in. Jesus had just taken his 12 disciples, okay, called them to himself. He said, guys, you've been watching what I've been doing. Now it's your turn. 
He says, I want you to go out into this city, right here in this city. Don't go beyond it. Go right here to the lost and the confused in this city. And guys, I want you to tell them that the kingdom of God is here. I want you to, to um, heal the sick. I want you to raise the dead. I want you to touch the untouchables. Okay? And guys, listen. Persecution's coming. Now go. And he sends them out. And this is where we pick it up. Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 and 3. When John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? He's basically saying, Jesus, are you the one or are we still waiting? Let me talk to you about John for a second. John is John the Baptist. For those of you who didn't grow up in church or didn't hear the story, John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin, okay? He's in prison. For no, for, he did nothing wrong. He went to the king. He went to King Herod, and he said, King Herod, it's not cool that you took, divorced your wife, took your brother-in-law's wife, and made it your own, made her your own wife. And King Herod doesn't like that and throws him in prison. This is Jesus' cousin, He's six months older than Jesus. When he was in Elizabeth's womb, John the Baptist, his mother was Elizabeth. When John is in Elizabeth's womb and Jesus um, is in Mary's womb and Mary walks in the door, it says he leapt in his mother's womb. This is John the Baptist who grew up in the wilderness eating bugs and honey, who was sent to proclaim the way of the Messiah. He was the one who was to prepare the way for his cousin Jesus. This is the same John the Baptist who baptized Jesus who saw the heavens open and heard the voice of God. And here he is doubting. Doubting that the one he had been sent to prepare the way for hadn't come, or maybe, maybe John was doubting that he didn't come and bring judgment, because that was John's whole message. If you ever look at like Luke 3, John the Baptist was saying, repent and be baptized. Like that was his message, repent and be baptized. He looked at the Pharisees and he said, you brood of vipers. You know, he's a little harsh. Where was God's judgment? If John had been preaching that, where was the judgment? I don't know, but this is what I know. He is experiencing a period of doubt after all of what he's known of Jesus, okay? Okay. And listen, remember, when John asks this question, he's in prison. When you are confined in a prison, when you are shut in darkness, when you're confined to the four walls of a prison, when you're chained with disappointment or frustration, doubts begin to trickle in. I have seen more people shaking their fist at God lately feeling stuck in this pandemic, feeling confined to the four walls of their home, and they're chained with fear or or hate or both, and they're wondering, where are you, God? Where are you? Where have you gone? Church, let me tell you something. He's here. He is with you, and he is within you. This stuff doesn't shock him. The, The political divide that we see doesn't shock God. Are we living in divided times? Yeah. I don't know if I've ever seen this kind of division. I feel like God is saying to us right now, look again. Look again. Look at what I'm doing. Because our faith is in God, right? We live by faith, not by sight. Our faith is in him. Yes? Is our faith in a political party candidate who will come and make everything better? You can hear a pin drop right now. I have never seen times like this in my life where people are so divided over politics. It's not wrong to be passionate about politics. It's not wrong to, you know, pray for your leaders. Actually, we're called to pray for our leaders. It's not wrong to be part of all that. But listen, church, listen. Can we look at the person sitting next to us and love them despite our political differences? Because it's gotten ugly out there. One day we will all sit together in here again. All the doors will be open. The masks will be off. We'll partake of communion together. Can you sit next to the person next to you and look at them as a child of God and love them? It might be time, church. It might be time to start thinking beyond what we see right now. We can't put our faith in a political party leader to make everything better. I tell you this because 
the Jews back then, that's what they were looking for too. They were under Roman oppression. They wanted a political leader who would come powerfully and free them from the rule and reign of Rome. Jesus didn't come that way. And John the Baptist was asking, Jesus, are you going to do these things or not? Are you going to bring us freedom? Are you going to bring your judgment? What did Jesus bring? Jesus brought a new wineskin to that time period. Let me explain that to you. In Bible times, they didn't have fancy wine bottles like we do today. When they made wine, they would take a goat skin and they would stitch it to make it watertight so it was sealable, you know, and, it, and water, or wine didn't leak out of it. And then they would take new wine and they would pour it in the wine skin. And as that new wine began to ferment, it would expand, expanding the wine skin. You never put new wine in an old wine skin or it would burst because it was not flexible enough to withstand the whole process of fermentation. Wine was always put in new wineskins. In the same way, Jesus did not come in political power, nor did he come to add to the old, he, nor did he come to add old wine. He came to add new wine, but he can't add it to the old religious system of rules and traditions. He brought in something new, didn't he? He brought grace and mercy. Jesus was the first one who brought us away to the Father, away to a holy God that we have direct access to a holy God. I don't know if we talk about that enough. God is a good, good father. I'll tell you what, you need to know God the Father. God is also a holy God. And Jesus is what brought us the opportunity to stand before him in confidence. And listen, Jesus would become the high priest. There would be no other need for priests like in the Old Testament. Jesus became that high priest, and in fact, those of you who become a Christian, when you become a Christian, when you come to salvation, you become priest to this world. How did Jesus respond to John's disciples? Let's go back to the text, verses 4 to 6. Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. What Jesus tells John's disciples, hey, go tell John that there's miracles happening. And he ties those miracles to the prophecies of Isaiah 61, which John would have known. John would have known Isaiah 61. But church, listen, there was a part missing. Let's go to Isaiah 61. This is talking about Jesus. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings or the good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are abound. Jesus came to proclaim liberty, freedom to the captives and to open those who are bound in prison. That talks about like spiritual blindness and physical blindness. John's in prison. Jesus is supposed to come open the door, let captives free, and John's in prison. Whether Jesus left that verse out intentionally to John's disciples, I don't know. But I believe what, what Jesus is saying is he's saying, John, listen to me. John, listen. Those shackled by demons are being set free. John, those who are shackled by leprosy are being set free. John, those who are shackled with addiction are being set free. John, you're focusing on what I'm not doing instead of what I am doing. And then he goes on to say this, blessed is the one who does not fall away or stumble on account of me. Another version says, blessed is the one who does not take offense at me. It's as if Jesus was saying, don't give up belief in me if I'm not meeting your expectations right now. Jesus knew that the Jewish people longed for Rome to be removed from power. But there was a blessing for those who were not offended that he didn't come for that kind of deliverance. Listen, listen. When Jesus came, he came as a lamb, right? He came as a baby. He didn't come with this big horse and a sword and a spear. He came as a lamb. But they wanted a lion. Church, one day Jesus is coming back. 
But he's not coming as a lamb. He's coming as a lion. It's as if Jesus is saying to us today, church, look again. Look at what I've done. Look at what I'm doing. Because it's easy to focus on the junk, isn't it? You turn on any news source. I'm not ripping reporters if there's a reporter here. I know you're doing your job. You turn on any news source, though. Does anyone see any good stories anymore? You see the destruction. You see the division. You see the devastation. You see a bit of a political circus. You see COVID, right? You see the rioting. You see all that isn't right in this world. And it's as as Jesus is saying to us today, look again, remember what I have done, focus on what I'm doing, and get this, and let go of what you think I should be doing. That's the second part of this sermon. The first part was look again, the second part is let go. Let me give you an example. Are there any people in here who like to lift weights? Yes, okay. So you'll get this. Um, And if you don't, it's okay because you'll understand what I'm saying. The first time I went back to the Y after we had shut down from COVID, I went to, I was just going to do a back and by workout. And I picked up the same dumbbells I had used like three months earlier. I could not get those suckers up, you know? And, And so I'm sitting here and I'm just straining. I'm like, what is wrong with me? Oh my gosh, this is humbling. And this guy next to me who works out when I do, he said, Kelly, how are you doing? I'm like, a little humble over here. And he said, Kelly, you're using your forearm strength. Let go. As soon as I let go of here, which I was gripping the weight with, it was like that mind-muscle connection came back and I could lift it up again. I have a friend, Lindsay, who's like that. I love working out with her. Kelly, why are you tightening that muscle? I don't know, old habit. Let it go. (laughs) Tighten this because this is what we're working. I share that with you because sometimes I think that we need to just loosen our grip on what we think God ought to be doing. Wouldn't it be great if God would just come back today? Or wouldn't it be great if all of a sudden we wake up and COVID's gone and everyone's living in harmony and everything's good again? Wouldn't that be something? Could God not be doing something else though during this time in the hearts of his people? Sometimes we need to loosen our grip on what we think God ought to be doing. You know, maybe you're here this morning and you have this grip on, on bitterness because of people that have gone off on you on Facebook or something, and you're just holding on to this bitterness. Let go. It's affecting you, not them. Do you trust God if you let go? I think sometimes I often, I white-knuckle stuff, you know? I like predictability and structure, if I'm honest. I really like predictability and structure, right? And, and I like to know where the destination is. I just want to know what's expected. And then all of a sudden COVID hits and you're homeschooling your kids. Any, any teachers here? Bless you. Bless you. Thank you for what you're doing. Any parents who are forced to be the teacher at home? Bless you. <laughs> I feel you. <laughs> I want to know what the rules are. And sometimes they're just not there. Sometimes we have to let go and just be faithful and just put one foot in front of the other and walk this out. Have you ever prayed for God to do something or take something away and he didn't do it? Some of you are nodding. I can, I can relate to that. There's times I, I want something to happen so bad that I actually put my faith and my hope in that desired outcome. An example of this, I'm thinking right now, I live with this heart condition. It's a weird thing. I'm on heart medicine for it. I thought for sure two weeks ago they were going to say, Kelly, go off your heart medicine. You know what they did? Kelly, you've got to increase your heart medicine. That was not what I was expecting. But I can't put my hope in the outcome that I want. My hope is in the one who can heal me at any time. My hope is in the one who can do whatever he wants to do through that. But I know there's people here this morning, you have prayed for God to take stuff away. You have prayed for him to take addiction away. And it hasn't happened. You have prayed for God to take your singleness away. And it hasn't happened yet. You have prayed for God to take infertility away. And it hasn't happened yet. I want you to ask yourself, what are you clinging to? What are you clinging to? Because do you trust God if you let go? This really boils down to trust, doesn't it? What happens if I let go? We're going to continue on in verses 7 to 15. If you have your Bibles, I'm just going to summarize those verses. 
This is where Jesus speaks about John to the crowd. So after he's addressed John's doubts, John's disciples walk away and Jesus says, hey, listen, this guy who's questioning right now, um, the, Jesus reminds them of God's calling on John's life, that he was God's chosen announcer. Perhaps in doing this, Jesus restored any doubts that people might have had and at the same time affirmed John's character. Sometimes I wish John would have heard what Jesus said. That would have been encouraging to John. But for whatever reason, his disciples are walking away at that time. In verses 16 to 24, the next section, Jesus condemns the attitude of his generation. That generation back then, they were skeptical. They were very skeptical and cynical because Jesus came challenging their comfortable, secure lives, and they don't want to change the way they lived. It was like they were shaking their fists at him even back then. In that passage, Jesus goes on to rebuke the cities that did not repent or believe even after they had witnessed and experienced the powerful, miraculous, life-changing ministry of Jesus. Those cities, if you read about them, if you want to go back and read about them, they saw powerful things happen. And yet even all that was not enough to turn away and turn towards the one who can do all things. Those cities mentioned, church, they're still in ruins to this day. We're going to pick it up here in verses 25 to 27 as Jesus breaks into a prayer. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Jesus was saying through that, he was glad that like the ordinary people of the world, those ones who maybe would be looked over, wouldn't be as flashy, wouldn't be, they wouldn't know it all. He was glad that they, though, that group of people came to understand who he was and it was hidden from the know-it-alls. Because back then the Pharisees, they were like the religious leaders, they put so many rules and regulations on the people that religion itself had become like labor. Okay? It was like Jesus was saying to those, those babes, those ordinary ones, hey, are you ready to abandon this legalism and follow me and the Father? He goes on to say in verses 28 to 30, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. That word means kind in the Greek, for my yoke is kind and my burden is light. The Son of God is inviting you to come to him. All you who are weary, anyone weary this morning? And not just because it's a Sunday morning and you haven't had your coffee? People are tired out right now, aren't they? It's tiring, it's tiring. And so many times we pray for that, that normal, I just want it to be back to normal. Church is never going to be normal again. We're going to find a new normal, though. Amen? We're going to find a new normal. Anyone in here burdened? You carry something heavy? Anyone in here heavy laden? Those are burdens other people's put on us, like other religions, shackles sometimes. Maybe it's your spouse. They just put these heavy burdens on you all the time. Have you ever hit the point in your life where the, the, the trials of this world feel so heavy and you feel like you're suffocating underneath them that you're about to break and you need to reach out for someone or something. This point is a deal breaker right here, this reaching out. Because for some people, you may turn to the bottle. You may turn to drugs. You may start cutting, whatever it takes to numb Listen, it's right here at this point that the Son of God is standing, arms wide open, saying, come to me. I will take you to the Father. I am the only way to the Father, and I will give you rest. That word rest in the Greek means to cease from labor to recover strength. He's saying, come out from under those burdens that you and that others, others have placed on you and get rest to recover strength for what's ahead. Anyone need rest for what's ahead? Yeah. This is very similar to Matthew 23, 4, where Jesus spoke against the religious leaders of his day as those who bind heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders that they couldn't even bear. 
Listen, this, this rest doesn't mean a tiptoe through the tulips. You remember that song? Tiptoe through the tulips and whatever they would do. It's not like that. I'm not going to stand here and tell you that it's going to be easy. I'm not. It's more like a footprints in the sand kind of home. You know, where the times that God carries you and there's only one set of footprints, that's the kind of rest I'm talking about. It's a rest to recover strength. And then he says this, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I, Jesus, am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is saying, yoke to me, learn from me. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I am not like those legalistic, perfectionistic, educated people who, who put all these things on you. I am gentle. I am humble. I am not a slave master. Those of you who grew up feeling like you have to perform all the time for God's love, take that sledgehammer to that chain. You are loved because you are his, and he is not a slave master. Let me show you a picture to help you understand the yoke, okay? Jesus used this imagery because the Jews would understand it. The first time I saw this is we were in India, and I was like, oh my gosh, this makes so much sense. A yoke was a heavy wooden bar placed over the neck of two oxen. And then in the middle, there was a place that would attach like a plow, so they would be plowing, okay? They did it to two because two are better than one. It forced these oxen to go in the same direction. And when a farmer was training a younger oxen through the plowing process, he would actually take and yoke it to an older, more experienced oxen. And that older, more experienced oxen had the, the burden of guiding the younger oxen through the plowing process. But listen, if you look at that, they both had a load to bear. It wasn't all on the older ox. They both had a load to bear. I think it's important we get that. They both had a load to bear. Because there's going to be times in your life that you carry a heavy load. I, ha I know I have. Some of you are right now, right? My question is, how do you carry that load? How do you carry that load? Jesus was saying, yoke yourself to me. Yoke yourself to me as Savior and get this, learn to yield to me as Lord. Because I am that older, more experienced ox. I know what to do. I want to help carry the burden. But you have to learn to, to trust me. And it boils down to trust. He is the one training and guiding us and he bears the greater part of the burden. He's saying, look again, I am with you, I'm right next to you. It's an invitation to get under his yoke and let go of your old life. It's an invitation to get under his yoke and let go of those traditions. Again, all traditions are not bad. Hear me when I say that. But some traditions bind people and you're like locked up because you just know the tradition. It's so ingrained in you. And Jesus is saying, come to me, yoke yourself to me and let go. Don't labor for my love, like getting back on the performance treadmill, but labor from my love. Because when you know you're loved by God and you know you're lovable to God, you want to walk with him. You want to be with him. In a crowd this size, and, and maybe if you're listening online, I just want to take a minute and give you that opportunity right now. If you have never trusted in on what Jesus did on the cross for you, because maybe you were traised, or raised to trust in what you did for God, if you have never put your faith or hope in Jesus, you can do that right now, sitting in this room or online. It's just coming to this place of saying, God, I need you. Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins. Jesus, I know you rose again, I, I, and I want to know you, and I don't understand all this, but God, I pray you would be real to me. I pray that you would lead me and guide me. And I just ask that you help me to live my life for you. Something simple like that. Because your faith then is in what he did. It is no longer in what you do. Amen? John 8.32 says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And that truth becomes like a sledgehammer. I know I keep saying that. I wish I had a sledgehammer, but I don't use tools. So <laughs> I don't even know what to do with it. If you made a choice just this morning, here or online, just something simple like that, Jesus, I just need you. I want you to go ahead and text the word trust to the number that will come on your screen because there's a pastor waiting. We want to help you grow. We, want this, we don't want this to be just 
lead you to the water and leave you. We want to help you grow. So you can go ahead and text TRUST to the number on your screen. Practically speaking today, as we talk about yokes, maybe you're here and you yoke under a, um, you labor under a yoke of chemical addiction. Maybe it's a, a yoke of pornography. Maybe it's a yoke of perfectionism. Maybe it's a burden you carry for unsaved family members. Or maybe it's the expectations you place upon yourself and you just don't have any grace for yourself. It's something that feels heavy on you and Jesus is inviting you. Yoke yourself to me if you haven't as, as a savior and yield to me as Lord because his yoke is meant to be kind and his burden is light because he bears it with us. Listen, as I was preparing this message and just praying, I just had this, this impression uh, come through my mind, and so I'm just going to share it. If it means something to you, you'll know, and if not, it's okay. And I don't know if it's for someone in the service or watching online, but it was just this idea that you labor under this fear of your children dying. You labor under a fear of your children dying, and you're trying to do everything you can in your power to make sure they're safe. And God is saying, let me carry that. It's cost you enough. Let me carry that. I'm going to invite my husband to come on up because he's going to share a testimony. As he's coming up, I want to share something with you, just a tangible story or testimony of a man that I met that I would consider, he, he had been in prison, actually. He was captive. And he came out from under this yoke of shame, and it was beautiful. His name, I'll call him Joe, just because I don't think I'm supposed to say names of people. We used to do, um, I used to be in full-time vocational ministry, and we used to do prison ministry up in Minnesota, okay? And so one weekend we went up there, we went to the prison, and everyone got assigned to um, a prisoner there that day. And I got, the last guy, had, no one had gone to him, and um, I'm calling him Joe. Joe was scary, looking, if I'm honest. He had words tattooed on his eyebrows and his knuckles that I can't say on a Sunday morning. And, and he was rough. His face looked rough. He was a big dude. And Bob, our leader, always said, whatever you do, don't look shocked. Whatever you do, don't look shocked. And so Bob and I go and we sit down with Joe. And Joe begins to tell us everything he ever did wrong. It was like he was trying to shock us or scare us away. And so we just kept listening with that face, and I am just praying, Lord, help this guy, help this guy. I don't know what happened except God showed up, and, and his time of trying to scare us away turned into a confession, and he began to just weep. He was crying so hard. He had snot dripping down his nose, and he is just sobbing, and he came to the place of saying, Jesus, I need you. I can't do this anymore, and, and, and he, he prayed to receive Jesus. He prayed to start a relationship, Okay. One thing I forgot to mention is Joe had this woman tattooed on his arm. It was a pretty graphic picture of a, a woman, okay? A year later, we went back. He got her a uh, tattoo of a uh, the swimsuit. He put a swimsuit on the lady on his arm, okay? And he looked different. His eyes were different. His demeanor was different. He had been set free. He was no longer laboring under a yoke of shame. That guy was living because he knew God loved him. He knew it was nothing he did, and he was walking in that grace and freedom. Glenn? Thanks, I've heard Jesus' word that his, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. I thought I understood it, at least up here. But how it actually works out is that when it comes down to the list of things that I have to do at, at work, at, at the house, with my family, at the end of the day or week or season, Whatever doesn't get done, I just got to do it. I figure that's my burden. But that wasn't working so well. See, when it gets to be too much, it takes the form of being short with people or task-oriented, lacking joy, and lacking time for the things that deep down are actually more important to me. I think it even causes physical pains in my jaw, like from clenching my teeth all day and uh, a tight neck and shoulder. Anyway, during marriage mentoring, Recently, um, some of our dear friends said, Glenn, Jesus' yoke is easy and his burden is light. And I was encouraged to take Jesus at his word. 
I started to ask the Lord to show me, are you trying to teach me more? Is there, is there a better way? Are you saying that your promise and your word is actually more practical than I'm realizing? So I, tried, I started to test it out. Um, so here's what I've been trying. When I find myself trying to solve my problems by taking more of a burden on myself, um, I slowed down and I asked, all right, God, help me. You say, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and you'll give us rest. So maybe I need a creative alternative or um, just I keep thinking that it's mine, all mine to get done. Maybe I need a helping hand. Um, help me know what to do. Help me to release the outcome, the success to you. So in some instances, the result of, um, was that instead of working longer on something or longer hours and doing everything in my power to make it a success and make it happen, I sensed maybe God telling me, this is how much time I'll spend on it and this is why. And I'm like, okay, okay, God, uh, just help me. And well, the outcome, it turns out, is even better than if I just pushed through and got it all done myself. And I feel the Lord's teaching me that he's not only my salvation and my advocate at the end, but he's my hope and my help and deliverer today. I haven't figured this all out. And honestly, it's, it's still a struggle because I do tend to resort, resort to the old, like learned ways. It feels like I'm taking three steps forward and then two steps back. But I'm seeing the value of making my daily burdens into his and seeking his ideas and his rest, his alternatives and his vision. It's allowed me to listen to ideas from other people. It's making me learn to not aim for perfection, but ask what's really needed here and aim for that. It's helping me realize that time is really precious. And instead of spending extra time on a project, um, because I shouldn't do that because it's actually practically taking me, uh, taking time away from my kids or just Nerf Wars or, you know, family fun or a quiet, restful conversation. It's, it's helping me have more margin. Well, I'm working on that. It's, I think it'll come. Uh, it's, it's letting me see my true priorities and that I need to be truthful even in saying no. Like, hey, that's, that's not my priority right now. It's helping me make more time and have more patience have more fun with my family so I don't have to feel like they're getting leftovers. Rumor is that my wife and my kids are seeing some differences, so it's kind of exciting. And this struggle and this effort seems to be worth it. So in conclusion, there's these dumbbells that we have at home and I see them every day. And I know where they are, I know what they look like, but I don't hold them or use them very much. Um, I feel like God's word in the Bible or that which he speaks to our heart it's like those dumbbells and I can see it or I can hear it, but if I don't take it and practically put it to use, then there's some implications. I'll be missing out, for example, on his daily promises for me, like this one about burdens, my burdens and the rest he gives. I may end up not knowing God's vision for me and may just follow the vision of the rest of the world. I may not find God's practical wisdom and help, but instead just follow the ways that seem wise to the world and may instead get help that actually hurts me uh, or those around me. So knowing Jesus as my savior, nobody can take away that free gift of salvation uh, that, that we've talked about in Galatians and Kelly's talked about. No one can add burdens to that. But even past eternal salvation, I see that his promise to the weary is also deeper and more practical. I've seen that I get weary daily and God wants to help me. And he wants to be the one who sustains me with, with every breath I take because he's the one who gives me that breath. He wants me to seek him and trust him and breathe. He wants me to be, he wants to be that help for me in times of need. Thanks, Thanks Glenn. As we wind down here, I just want to share one last thing with you just was praying for this message. Again, I know there's a lot of different pieces in this message, but I just heard the phrase cities of refuge. And to be honest, I've never really studied that, okay? Um, but I believe there's a nugget here for someone. Let's go to Numbers 35, 9 to 15.
Then the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, When you cross the Jordan into Canaan, select some towns to be your cities of refuge, to which a person who has killed someone accidentally may flee. They will be places of refuge from the avenger. The avenger is like the nearest relative, okay, to the person who was killed. So that anyone accused of murder may not die before they stand trial before the assembly. These six towns you give will be your cities of refuge. Give three on this side of the Jordan and three in Canaan as cities of refuge. These six towns will be a place of refuge for Israelites and for foreigners residing among them so that anyone who has killed another accidentally can flee there. Back then in Levitical law, if you killed someone, you were liable to be killed yourself, okay? But what if it was accidental? What if there was no intent to murder, okay? What if, what if, what if Brittany and I had had, um, what if Brittany and I had known each other a long time, we're good friends, and uh, we had an argument, and I decide I'm going to make her a meal as like a peace offering, okay? Years ago, she told me she was allergic to peanuts, and I make a dish loaded with peanuts, and Brittany eats it, has anaphylactic shock, and dies, okay? It wasn't intentional. It was accidental. Back then, for that kind of stuff, you were still liable to be put to death. But God, in his wisdom and, and justice, said we need these cities of refuge so Kelly or whoever does the crime can flee to those cities. If not, that family member, that avenger, is going to kill them. What would happen then is I would flee to the city of refuge. And when I got there, these, these gates were closed, and the Levitical leaders would hear my story. I'm so sorry, this is what happened. I, I killed Brittany, but it wasn't intentional, and da-da-da-da, and I tell the whole story. If they realize, you know what, that was not intentional, they allow me to come into the city of refuge, and they close the gates. You know what happens at that point? The avenger cannot touch me. And I am not allowed to leave the gates of that city either, because if I, if I step outside, the avenger can, can kill me. Do you know when I would get to leave that city? When the high priest died. There is so much to this, this city of refuge. I'd love for someone to preach on it one day. But I just want to break this down. The manslayer, the person who killed, that represents a sinner. Some of you have, have never grown up in church. You've never even heard you're a sinner. I'm going to tell you what Romans 3, 23, 23 says, and not to make you feel bad, but just to tell you the truth. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all in need of a savior. So the manslayer represents the sinner. The avenger, the nearest relative, represents justice. And the city of refuge represents Jesus. The, city, uh, the, the sinner can flee to the city of refuge and find forgiveness. The only difference is now, talking nowadays, sometimes we are guilty, right? Sometimes we just do things we want to do. But listen, there's no need for a trial. I don't have to go before any leaders and plead my case. I don't have to say so many prayers to be forgiven. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That means I am free. I am clean. I am forgiven. I don't have to do anything else. I don't have to flog myself on the back anymore. I don't have to keep serving and performing for forgiveness. Listen, when the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. When you are forgiven, you don't have to pick up that guilt anymore. Stop picking up the guilt that you feel even after you've been forgiven. Someone needs to hear that because I know when you come out of a, a tradition where you are told you have to pray so many prayers, you have certain acts you have to do for God to forgive you. Can I just tell you the truth of what 1 John 1, 9 says? You're forgiven. You take that sledgehammer and you break that off of you. And listen, remember, remember that yoke we talked about, that picture earlier? When we come to him, when we're yoked to him, we get to learn to yield to him. And we will begin to grow stronger as we walk with him, as we walk beside him. How do we grow? What does that look like practically? If you consider yourself a follower of Jesus, walk with him in prayer in the word, in community with other believers. There's many ways to do that here, even digitally, okay? You can get on firstfree.org. There's Alpha. There's a prayer course. There's Bible studies. There's all these ways to come into the building or even do it on digitally, okay? 
If you're, if you're tuning in and you don't go to First Free Church and you're from another area, find a Bible preaching church in your town and get involved. Because we need to grow. And listen, more than even, in, in addition to growing, we need to be yoked to something, right? As everything shifts right now, we need to be firmly yoked to something. We need to look again. Church, listen. I, I sometimes just feel the heaviness when I walk in here on a Sunday. I sometimes just feel the weight of what people are carrying. These are tough times. But listen, God is not finished with us yet. And he's not finished with you yet. There is someone here in this room right now, you think God is so fed up with you. Let me tell you something, he is not done with you. There is a gift in turning back to him. There is a gift in that. Sometimes you just got to come back home. At the end of his life, the Apostle Paul, who wrote Galatians, wrote some letters to Timothy. Timothy was a young guy that he was mentoring. And it's at the end of his life, he writes this, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I have kept the faith. My hope for all of you is that you'll fight the good fight of faith. That you will finish the race. It is never too late to come back to him. It is never too late. And I hope, church, I hope that you'll look again. When things are just heavy and overwhelmed and all you see is a destruction, look again. Look again to see what God is doing. And I hope you'll be able to tell the difference between a possum and a puppy. Okay? Look again, church, and let go of what you think God ought to be doing right now in your life or in this world. He's God. He can do what he wants to do. But I know this, he has come to set us free. Look again and let go. This is your time to respond. Aaron and the team are going to lead us in a response song. And at the end, I'm going to invite prayer team people, if there's any here, to come up. And, and Glenn and myself and Cody will also be here to pray for you. So this is your time to respond to the Lord.
faith and trust in you we're adopted into the family called children of God we're given this new nature a nature that's not the flesh we're given freedom and so God I just I pray that for everyone in this room whoever's watching online we would walk in that freedom we would walk in this new nature we've been given Take care.